I am super excited to be here today. Um, go easy on me, I'm a little nervous, but I figure if, um, if I can teach intro students how to sew on Zoom at 8.15 in the morning, then uh, this should be a piece of cake. <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, you're here to get a um, behind the scenes view at what goes on uh, to make costumes happen for our theater productions uh, here at ETSU. But um, you're also gonna find out um, how, how we make them and what all goes into creating uh, these costumes that I'm gonna show you and that you get to see on stage. Uh, so um, yeah, I am the costume shop supervisor here at ETSU. Um, so my primary um, function is to run the costume shop and I also uh, supervise the uh, student workers that come in. We have federal work study students, um, APS scholarship students, and then um, we have our own uh, theater scholarship students, and then also um, students that take uh, a lab credit also come and work in the costume shop. Uh, as well as our scene shop, but that's another story that I don't know much about now. <laughs> I'll, um, so I, I kind of uh, handle the costume half of things. And um, I also um, sort of inspire students on how to uh, design costumes as well as construct them. Um, I am an adjunct instructor and I teach um, uh, intro to theater production, where I teach students how to hand sew on Zoom currently, but I'm really looking forward to using this gorgeous space to teach them all sorts of things in person. <laughs> uh, and then this semester, I am teaching advanced theater production, um, and I co-teach these classes with Zach Olson, uh, the, the scenic, uh, the scene shop um, supervisor equivalent to me. We call him a technical director, but you know. <laughs> um, and so I am teaching advanced theater production and I'll share uh, some of the things that our students are learning in that class as well with you. Um, but I guess let's start with the um, the thought of design. So design uh, for theater, uh, for costumes is where we start. Um, I also am sort of the primary designer uh, for our department, but I really love having students take over that task for me. <laughs> um, I would say at my heart, I am a theater technician. So I actually really specialize in how to um, take someone else's idea and create it. Uh, how to take a, a, an abstract idea or a two-dimensional drawing or picture, and how do I make it into this three-dimensional functional garment that meets all of the needs of the show? And not just what's written in the script, but also um, the director's vision and um, collaborating with my fellow designers. Um, also, any um, needs that the actor has or that the role specifically has. Um, and in addition to that, what you know, you can sort of flip through the script or talk to the director about. In addition, um, we also were really striving to help tell the story. Um, and we can do that through shape and color. Um, but really, um, it's uh, we love making super cool, flashy, awesome things, but it's actually most important that we don't get in the way of the actor's ability to tell the story. So sometimes we kind of have to rein ourselves in, um, but it really is about um, meeting the needs. And theater is always going to be something weird. So while I have a foundation in garment construction that, you know, could pass for the fashion industry, and I do teach my students some of those techniques, really, um, I try and teach my students how how to think and problem solve. That's probably the best uh, thing that I can pass on to them, especially for theater, because while you may see something on a fashion runway, there is one way to make that garment. There is a correct way to make that garment, and it absolutely must be done that way. But in theater, we learn all of the ways to make a garment because who knows, this actor may need to be doing a cartwheel while on fire, you know? Like, I mean, you just never know. <laughs> we never sort of use the same technique twice. Um, so it really is about problem solving. Um, 
And uh, so we use color a lot as well. Um, let's say we have, um, you know, a, a pair of, of uh, characters that start out the um, show really hating each other. You know, maybe you choose um, some, uh, some colors that really clash together. You know, maybe one of them is in, you know, red is their predominant color and another the, the green is their predominant color. But, you know, as the story progresses and they develop as characters, you know, they decide, oh, we're madly in love. I don't know. It sounds like some Shakespeare I've read. I'm sure <laughs> you too, right? So then, you know, maybe their colors subtly transition, you know, from um, green to blue and from red to purple. And then suddenly they're all, you know, in harmony with each other as they fall madly in love and everyone lives happily ever after or dies, you know, if it's Shakespeare is one or the other, right? <laughs> so, um, as the designer, I have to work with, um, you know, uh, collaborate with the rest of the team. And then I have to be able to clearly communicate with the rest of the shop. Um, so also in the shop, you have the shop manager, which is what I also do. Can I say that I really, what I love about my job here is that all of the jobs I'm telling you about, I get to do, and I get to teach students how to do them. Um, I may not be, you know, the milliner, which is a hat maker. Um, you know, at all times, but um, depending on the shows that we're doing, that may be a task that students um, get to really dive into and learn about. So we don't just make pretty dresses, we make all kinds of stuff. And I'll walk around and show you some of that in a minute. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, the designer has to be able to communicate with the costume shop manager. So I get to be all of these roles um, and I get to teach students lots of different tasks. So um, no two students have the same experience in the costume shop because it depends on the shows that we're doing. Um, and our department really does an amazing job getting input from the fellow faculty members, but also the students. Um, and we really put a lot of effort into our season selection, not just you know what will please our audiences but what are some really great opportunities for our students um, not just acting but also um, you know what sort of uh, costume builds or craft construction uh, can be involved in um, our shows that we choose so um, the designer uh, comes up with the great ideas and they have to find a way to clearly communicate them to the rest of the shop which is headed up by the shop manager um, and so the shop manager manages the budgets, keeps things on schedule, is generally held responsible for, uh, you know, fires and explosions and problems <laughs> and problem solving. So um, from there, we also have um, the, the shop is divided up into teams of workers. Um, so we have the draper and the draper is um, the primary pattern maker or the person that's in charge of really figuring out how do I take these crazy ideas and make them into things that work and are on time. <laughs> Because you can't really just say, I need an extension to the audience. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. So, um, so time management, super important, keeping the workflow going. Um, the draper is a garment engineer. Uh, so for example, I uh, draped this dress here, but then um, I walked students through how to construct it step by step. And um, Luckily, I was the designer, so I had an easy enough time talking to that person. <laughs> no, but she kept wanting things that we didn't have time to make. It, um, but that is a, uh, a negotiation that happens. The designer wants everything just like the director does, right? <laughs> You're just caught up in all of these great ideas, but then the shop manager has to, okay, but then reality, we have this much money, you have this much time and we have students that, uh, you know, while they're great workers, they are still learning and they have to go to other classes. Like, what is that about? <laughs> we have theater to make here now. Um, so there are all of these factors we have to think about. 
Um, so the draper uh, patterns the garments and then um, hands them off to uh, the first hand is like their uh, uh, chief minion, <laughs> head assistant to the draper. Um, and they take the information from the draper and convey it to the stitchers, the people that are sewing on sewing machines and actually putting the stuff together. This way, the draper can go on and make patterns for the next thing that has to be made. And then the first hand is keeping the workflow moving. Um, and so that's sort of the structure, uh, the hierarchy of how the workflow happens in the costume shop. And so when students come in, we start them off with some real basic tasks like you know sew a label into this garment because you know if there is a chorus of 10 men singing in tuxedos all of those garments are going to look exactly the same and we need to know who's the suits <laughs> so uh you know you can start out by sewing a label or learning to iron and things like that and then you know moving up to hemming pants or creating an entire garment um or also draping so that is sort of a basic rundown real quick. Sorry if I talked a little fast, um, but about sort of how work flows through in the costume shop. And so now I think I'll take you on a little tour and show you some of the stuff that our uh, students have made uh, in the time that I've been here. Uh, obviously, they made gorgeous things before I got here, but <laughs> um, I will say that if someone asks me, you know, what, what is your favorite project you worked on? Or, you know, what is the best, um, you know, experience that you've had? Or what are you the most proud of? And before I came to work here, I would say, you know, like, oh, this thing I did in grad school that was real cool. Or, oh, when I worked at this ballet on this giant, you know, um, mainstream, huge, multi-million dollar production, that was super cool. But actually, now that I've worked here, I would say that Playhouse Creature which is the first show that I designed here and really um, sort of dove in, uh, is the one that I am the most proud of because um, students, uh, like you can see, this uh, this is not a simple garment. <laughs> uh, students that had never sewn before ended up, uh, we made five of them, not exactly, actually six, of, of this equivalent of uh, fanciness and intricacy. Um, and yeah, it was rough, but the students did an amazing job and they were so proud of themselves when they were done and having something like this and seeing it not just on a dress form is cool, but like seeing it actively under the lights and having the actors uh, bring the costume to life and seeing the costume bring the actors to life and their work as well uh, is one of the most gratifying things. So <laughs> um, we try to have a positive environment even when it gets stressful, but um, there is always that gratification at the end of seeing like, yes, we did that and it looks beautiful under the lights. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to detach my screen and turn my camera around so that I can give you a tour um, of some things that I have spread out here in the costume shop. So um, we're still in the process of, um, we're still in the process of moving in. Um, and I will say that because, um, you know, there was this pandemic that happened. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of things are moving uh, more slowly as we have windows. This is so exciting. You don't even know. Most costume shops are actually in the basement of buildings and never have windows. Uh, anyways, <laughs> um, but uh, so obviously due to the pandemic, um, uh, we are a little behind on acquiring uh, all of our equipment for um, this area, but I, I will say that um, the Martin Center staff and facilities are doing an amazing job to get things to us and they're starting to come in every day. So we're so excited. Um, so, you know, we're still under construction, so to speak. Uh, but um, yeah, I'll walk you around and show you some things. So for this, Sorry, and I apologize if I make anyone seasick. I'm gonna try not to. <laughs> so um, this is what we're doing in my, uh, sorry, I'm trying to figure out which, like which direction do I aim? <laughs> um, there we go. So uh, this is what we're doing in my uh, costume 
uh, advanced, uh, advanced production techniques class. And they're learning how to drape the basic forms on the dress form. And from these basic, they're called slopers, but from these basic shapes, um, it's like the foundation that then gets manipulated to make everything else. And so uh, we have some, <laughs> we made some little out of a, a, a duct tape shell <laughs> and we stuffed it. So we made some little dress forms for everyone to take home with them. Uh, so that is how we are able to distance learning. Um, but uh, you can see, so this is sort of the process that goes into um, creating uh, a garment. We'll drape it on the dress form. And then, you know, when we pull it off, it looks like a bunch of random shapes that uh, don't make a lot of sense. So we put uh, information on our pattern pieces so that we know how they match up, just like a puzzle, but a weird curvy shaped puzzle. <laughs> Um, and then, so that actually just turns into uh, a, a bodice that looks very similar to this one. And a student did that. I'm so excited by it. <laughs> uh, we don't just make garments. Um, this is from, a student made this uh, out of a, a thermoplastic material for, unfortunately, we were going to do Bridge to Terabithia, but that show got canceled due to the pandemic. But um, we have an amazing fawn mask that came out of it. <laughs> so um, students, basically they sculpt a shape onto, uh, we'll use like a, um, a cast face or sometimes a styrofoam uh, head and then use clay to sort of come up with the shape um, on, the, uh, on the face to sort of build up the shape that we want like this. Um, and then covered in uh, aluminum foil and um, heat up the thermoplastic and shape it. And then it gets painted. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Not everything that we make is beautiful. <laughs> Sometimes we get to um, tear stuff up. <laughs> and let me just say it's super gratifying. <laughs> well, it's gratifying if it is an old garment that's already falling apart in stock, but if you have to make something brand new and then destroy it, it kind of hurts your soul a little bit, but that's the job. Um, so uh, using, you know, like, uh, the equivalent of a cheese grater and some knives, some fire, some sandpaper, uh, I don't know, run over it with your car. <laughs> we use any of the techniques we can. Um, you know, putting, uh, we have a lot of things that look dirty and disgusting, but it's actually um, fabric paint rather than uh, <laughs> whatever sort of mold or crud that you think it is. Uh, over here, we've got some costumes that we're putting together for um, the uh, musical theater showcase that's coming up. Uh, these are some more masks that were done um, in that same sort of way. Uh, these are some props from a show we did called Mr. Burns that is sort of a post-apocalyptic um, take on the Simpsons. <laughs> and so uh, we have, uh, what is it, um, uh, Lisa is here and Marge and um, Bart. And then let's see, this is Sideshow Bob. <laughs> uh, and so this was sort of a found object uh, project that was really cool because uh, again, this is another one of those like cartwheels on fire. <laughs> uh, we're making Marge Simpson, but out of, uh, you know, it's this weird can hat. <laughs> um, Currently, we aren't making much in the shop, but we are helping out um, the marching band. My, I had a student um, take this existing coat and um, basically used fabric and instead of draping on a dress form, draped on um, this coat and created a pattern for it. So we're going to be um, making some specialty coats for some drum majors that you may see in the fall. So that's something exciting to look for. Um, I won't give 
give it away. I don't know if it's a surprise or not, but we're excited to be making stuff. Um, wigs, wig styling, um, that's something that our students do. Uh, we also, we have a lot of gorgeous costumes now that were donated from um, Celebrate is the, uh, it was the costume rental company in town and they have uh, shut down their costume rental side of things. I think they still rent, you know, tents and things for your wedding, but we got a huge donation of amazing costumes from them that has really um, increased our costume stock that we are so thrilled about um, because as much fun as it is to uh, make things, uh, we can't make everything <laughs> because then it's not fun anymore. <laughs> um, this is one of my uh, favorite pieces because it was designed by a student and then uh, made by another student who had never made a dress before. And so it's when I see things like this that I go, yep, I really love my job. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see. Um, that's a lot of things that we have done. Um, another thing that I think is great about um, the opportunities that we have here is that uh, we make, uh, or, or I guess what I love about um, making costumes for performance is that we have um, all different shapes and sizes. Uh, before I came to work here, I worked at um, the Houston Ballet, which is one of the, uh, one of the top ballet companies in the country. Uh, and it was great, but um, everyone was the same size. <laughs> and, uh, you know, within, within, a, within a range, but, you know, everyone was the same size and um, all the, their aesthetic was the same. I, um, I remember one of my first projects there was uh, making a, a Greco-Roman dress and um, I made a gorgeous one, but it was historically accurate. And they were like, what is this? Um, because they have an aesthetic which is uh, as little frump as possible. <laughs> they want to see as much of the dancer's body and movement, which makes sense. But it was like, oh, so you don't actually want a Greco-Roman dress at all. And there's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, so, so the different types of venues uh, require, uh, you know, have different needs that need to be met. Um, so for example, opera, there isn't probably as much, um, you know, movement going on as there is in a, a a ballet or a play with a giant fight choreography scene. Um, or I worked on a ballet with a sword fight scene. <laughs> that was a lot of movement. <laughs> so um, that's another thing that we have to take into account. So uh, we don't always have to make every pattern from scratch. Some exist out in the world, but um, when it comes to historical garments, we can't just look up the historical patterns because they're designed for different shaped bodies. Um, also, they're designed for women to only be able to raise their arms this high. I have yet to meet a director that is okay with their actors only raising their arms this high for the entire show. <laughs> so we definitely um, uh, do a lot of historical research, but again, we also have to sort of reinvent everything as we go. Um, yeah, I think I talked for a while. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I would love to share more information with you. <laughs> well, I'll le I will lead off. Um, so, uh, so talking about historical garments and I don't know, is that Nell Gwynn behind you? I'm not sure it from is. Playhouse. That's a good call. It is Nell Gwynn. Good, good. <laughs> but Once my favorite. Not famous. <laughs> yes. Nay, nay, good folk. I'm the Protestant whore. Right. So, <laughs> yes. So I'm wondering if you're making historical garments for Nell Gwynn on stage now, do you make historical underwear? And if so, what's that like? 
Right, so we do have um, structural garments that we put underneath. Um, and if I was going to uh, drape something with a, a bustle, I would have a structure like this underneath it when I'm creating the pattern so that I have the structure. Just like if I was making a, a dress for someone that was a little bigger than my dress form, I would pad it out. Um, and so uh, when it comes to theater though, we do use historical garments like, you know, a hoop skirt or a corset, except sometimes we have quick changes. And so let's say she needs to get out of this garment real fast and into a, a garment where she looks like a peasant boy, right? Um, but we don't have time to get in and out of a corset because if you've ever done that, it takes a little while. <laughs> so a lot of times we have to build the structure into the garment itself rather than relying on um, historic undergarments like they would have in reality. Um, a lot of times we have to use uh, secret uh, tips and tricks um, to sort of create the theater magic. Does that help answer <laughs> your question? Oh yeah, that is, that's, that's so amazing. I would have never imagined that. And um, when I was younger, actually, between um, uh, high school and college, I worked at the local, um, uh, so I'm from Savannah, Georgia. So I worked at the History Museum. And one of the projects that I did for them was I created some um, undergarment structures, so like a bustle and um, a corset. And one of the things they liked to, and I made it from the um, historic pattern. And one of the things that they did is they put the, um, the historic pattern corset on a modern shaped um, mannequin so that people could see the extreme differences in bodies from here from now and then because um, while we can add structure to the garment that sort of forces the body into various poses and positions like the you know your posture to change your posture like unless you wear a corset from the age of infancy you know you aren't going to have that super extreme shape because it actually changes um the anatomical structure inside your body um also we do have to be careful when we have people come in and try on corsets for um their uh um for their costumes because uh you know we always have to have a chair ready and make sure check throughout the fitting do you need to sit down for a minute because your organs actually shift around once you put it on. <laughs> so that's just a little tidbit. <laughs> And I have um, a lot of not suitable for work stories from previous jobs. <laughs> Let's just say um, a lot of interesting things has happened when you're dealing with garments behind the scenes. <laughs> but um, I would say having a uh, sense of humor and um, you know just going with the flow is probably the easiest way to deal with it. Um, I tell my students that half of what I teach them is how not to create an HR nightmare or a sexual harassment suit. <laughs> So, um, yeah, uh, but uh, I guess I just touched on it real quick, but um, that is sort of half of the exciting magic is what happens. So I've talked about what happens inside the shop, but um, there's an army of people running around backstage during the actual show as well, facilitating the performance. Um, so they don't just take care of the garments and make sure that they're clean and looking gorgeous for the uh, next show, but um, the work wardrobe supervisor and um, you know their crew of dressers um, make sure that garments aren't missing. <laughs> uh, they also facilitate quick changes backstage and part of that is something that we actually end up choreographing um, during dress rehearsals. Um, it's you know um, this person needs to stand here and um, be unbuttoning their shirt while this other person is taking their shoes off and we need to tell the actor to stand on their right foot first and then when they tap their foot switch to your left foot and so there's actually quite a bit of literally choreography that goes into the help um to, and you're like I can change my own clothes like no it's, it's quick changes have to happen so very fast that literally you are getting undressed and redressed all at the same time and sometimes we do interesting things like layering garments um, someone may come out in a gorgeous dress but they may have a whole nother outfit on underneath that you don't even know about um, yeah <laughs> any other questions I, I have a question for you Beth one thing that I 
marvel at what you do is the conversations that you're having with the designer as you're creating, or sorry, with the director as you're creating, and then also, you know, translating that uh, to to the design, but then working with the performer um, and working with them on helping them to realize their character. I, I would imagine that you often have times where they might be reluctant to to go with the costume you know i i feel i mean as as a like when i was performing myself you know putting on something and thinking i don't feel comfortable in this or you know how how do you navigate all of that particularly working with a performer who is nervous or you, you, you know and young in their career like yeah, ours yeah um well so there is this fine line that you have to walk so um i've had um i've had like adult award-winning performers tell me i don't wear purple and it's like okay but it literally says you wear a purple dress i can't change the script that's the way above my pay grade <laughs> Um, you know, or they're like, but I want to look pretty. I'm sorry, your character is the ugly witch. I cannot help you with that. <laughs> but it is also really important for the actor to feel comfortable in their garment. You want them um, ideally to put on the garment and you physically see their character come alive in their eyes. Um, that is that is the ideal experience is that, uh, and sometimes, you know, you have actors that come in and they don't quite know who their character is until their costume fitting. Or, and I'll tell the directors this, I may not quite know what their character is supposed to look like until they come in and talk to me about it. Um, it is a back and forth. Um, it's a negotiation because um, we are all collaborating. Um, yes, there are instances where you just have to put your foot down and say, I'm sorry, this is what you're wearing. Um, but that's not anywhere near the first answer. <laughs> um, it is always a conversation because it's not, and it's not a, a tug of war, you know, it's not I'm right, you're wrong. It's about how do we come up with, um, you know, the perfect storm for this show that meets the actor's needs, but also the directors and the show, you know, um, so there's also a lot of um, talking them through. Uh, a lot of times, they're not quite sure. And so by telling them, you know, oh, this is how you can work this skirt, you know, or, um, uh, you know, sort of showing them ways that they can own the garment and make sure that they're wearing the garment rather than the garment wearing them. <laughs> um, yeah, a big thing is shoes, um, being able to move. Um, that's what I listen to the most. Um, I don't think I look pretty in green. I'm, I'm going to hear that and I'm going to assess where does that rank on, on, on the importance with everything else, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> Beth, I know you've talked a lot about some of the challenges that um, you are faced as both a costume designer and as a costume shop manager. Can you tell us maybe a story of one of the biggest challenges you had to overcome in a show and how you went about overcoming that? Oh my God, there was a student worker we had named Hunter and like he was just a mess. <laughs> uh, Hunter did work in the costume shop with us for a bit and was a delight despite what I just said. <laughs> um, right, sorry, repeat your question. I got distracted. <laughs> Think of a time where you had a, a large challenge in a show that you had to then overcome and how you overcame that. Um, maybe like one yeah. of your- so um, more often than not, it's we've run out of time. <laughs> and I will say that working here is, again, amazing. In case you did, couldn't tell that I really like my job. <laughs> and not just because I have this fancy new building. But um, here, everyone comes together and helps, which is amazing. Zach Olson, the TD, uh, I set him up with the serger, which I told him this is like a table saw. It just happens to also be sewing. <laughs> 
you did a great job. <laughs> uh, Melissa, the lighting designer, came in and uh, punched grommets in a garment for it, you know. Um, so just like I've also gone over and helped sand a door and paint some stuff. I'm like, I have, I have uh, uh, no knowledge but I know when to ask a question, give me a tool, <laughs> same sort of thing. Um, and so that's actually what is really great about our department um, is how everyone comes together and you're not on your own. Uh, this is a hugely collaborative effort um, and we all take that very seriously, so yeah. And the students are great, even though they have to go to class and do homework. <sighs> I'll ask a question just out of curiosity. What is the most elaborate costume that you've ever had to create? Oh, um, okay. When I worked at the Houston Ballet, uh, we spent over a year building a $5 million production of the Nutcracker, which is their cash cow. That's how they pay for everything else they do. Um, and so I was in charge of, among other things, but um, Clara's garments. And so um, towards the end, she gets this fancy, gorgeous ball gown covered with flowers and is just exploding with amazingness. So yeah, I would say that, or Bix the hip hop beaver. <laughs> um, so he was like, uh, he's from the show, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, uh, Bright Ideas, I think it's, Bright ideas. It's um, basically there. Uh, these parents are uh, super cutthroat about getting their kindergartner into the right school so that the rest of their life is okay. And then it ends with like um, this sort of Chuck E. Cheese ish looking scene. And so there's Bix the hip hop beaver. And uh, so he's this giant mascot costume that does, you know, a break dance. And he's got like a little uh, X of tape where his tail's been pulled on too many times. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, one of those two. <laughs> and that actor, uh, he improv and on the very last night of the show decided to do the splits at the very end of his hip hop dance and his costume held up. So that's why you always want to design it for maximum movement because you never know, uh, you know, what sort of bug is going to take the actor. <laughs> what sort of inspiration is going to get in them? <laughs> Um, oh, Karen Brewster, my supervisor, has uh, told me that I should mention something about uh, my summer work. <laughs> so in general, in the summers, I um, do summer stock theater. I work at Montana Shakespeare in the parks. And uh, I basically, I go out there and for a month and a half, I build two shows, um, you know, with a team, obviously. <laughs> and um, there are two designers, a different designer for each show. And I just basically head up the build. Uh, and then at the end of that, we send the actors off into the wilds of the West on their own for the rest of the summer and just say, great, bye. <laughs> um, and so we have to build those super durable. There's a lot of, um, you know, like for the ballet, we've got to have extreme movement. Um, for outdoor traveling summer theater, you've got to have durable <laughs> and as um, lightweight as possible. And um, so this, the last time that we did it for the coronavirus, um, I had to make a giant false staff fat suit. Um, and a lot went into it to make sure that the actor didn't pass out on stage. Um, out West, it can get real cold. So he was fine on those days. But on the days when it got hot, we got to make sure that he doesn't have to pass out. Luckily, he was um, an experienced seasoned actor. So I didn't have to go too in depth into the uh, talking him into putting the ice packs in his armpits and his groin. <laughs> he was like, oh yeah, give me all the ice packs. I was like, you've done this before. <laughs> um, I tried to tell them all about how it would need some you know, serious spraying down on the inside with vodka. So vodka and water works better than Febreze, just so you know. <laughs> um, and then, you know, air it out in the sun because this thing was going to start to stink real fast. And they travel in an enclosed space all together. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Three days into the tour, I get an emergency phone call. What did you say about how to make that smell go away? <laughs> um, but it is super important um, 
these summer opportunities for theater for people like me, but also for our students. Um, for me, it helps me to go out and do professional theater elsewhere and learn from other um, professionals. Uh, I'm always learning new techniques and that's part of the exciting thing. Um, but it's also really great for students to get their um, sort of their feet wet, their first experiences um, in doing theater in a professional setting. Um, most summer stocks provide housing, which also sort of enables um, the ability to go out and have these different experiences at different jobs while still maintaining your regular income <laughs> during the year. Um, but summer theater is, um, really great opportunity for students to go out and experience. You have giant um, sh shops where your specific task is very narrow and you do a lot of it, um, or you have smaller shops where your responsibility is everything and you do a whole lot of uh, different things. So, yeah. There's a, a couple, I just want to amplify a couple questions in the chat. Paige asks, um, what's the worst fabric to manipulate when creating costumes and what's the best? And then Heidi has a follow-up, but first things first. Okay, the worst fabric, I'm going to go with probably either stretch velvet or stretch pleather. <laughs> Um, chiffon is a very lightweight, almost see-through, um, flowy fabric. It's very difficult to work with. You just have to be super delicate with it. Uh, but um, stretch velvet and stretch pleather, uh, they're, they're like, they have so many factors going on. The stretch, terrible. <laughs> Always a pain. Um, but then um, there's a, a grippy texture to the velvet or the pleather that keeps it from wanting to go through the machine well. Um, but it's easier to make stretch things fit people. It's just the construction of the garment that is uh, more difficult. <laughs> also neoprene is, we make things out of all kinds of weird stuff. Um, uh, uh, like mesh screens. We use all sorts of things for structure. <laughs> so what's the best? Um, muslin, <laughs> which is uh, untreated, undyed cotton. So it's what we uh, basically do all of this out of. It's super cheap. Um, and it's, it's sort of like your base layer fabric that um, it doesn't cause any additional problems for you. <laughs> it, uh, it's as uh, cooperative as fabric gets. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I was wondering, so I submitted my question shortly after Paige. Um, so how do these different fabrics impact or affect your process for different performances? So you're talking about working in summer theater versus not summer theater. And so in terms of timelines or maintenance of pieces or order of operations, how does fabric impact that? Um, I so we look at fabric as far as um, it's called the hand of the fabric and it's um, it the way I tell my students to remember it is how does it feel when you touch it, but it's also how does the fabric move? Does it flow or is it crunchy? Um, is it stiff? That sort of thing. So all of that, those are all choices that we make um, regarding character and um, the designer will choose for the garment. But when it comes to um, constructing, you have to look at um, uh, the function. So um, a big factor is, can I wash it? Do I need to wash it? Um, for example, this band um, uh, coat that I was loaned has this very uh, cool um, feature to it where, uh, so it's got the collar, but then inside there's another collar made out of cotton. So it's meant to be taken out and easily washed. So that sort of thing, we have to figure out um, how, how are we going to maintain cleanliness, but also um, structure. So the designer will pick a fabric that they think is, it may be the right color and the right pattern, but it's totally wrong for um, the type of garment they want. Maybe they've picked something super 
flow and they want a real structured um, garment out of it. So that's where the draper has to, you know, engineer the garment. They have to um, add, choose, choose the guts <laughs> so that, um, you know, it's basically the fabric that the designer has chosen is like an overlayer, but um, uh, the, the draper determines what are the guts inside of this that I need for it to actually have the look um, that we're going for. Perfect. And then my other question, which you kind of got at was, how do you keep things clean? And so we've learned your vodka and water trick. Right, which <laughs> I don't use here at the university, but <laughs> Fabrice is okay. Um, yeah, so um, that's also something that we have to think about when we're constructing the garment. Sometimes we'll put pit pads in things. Um, a lot of times um, fancy garments are dry clean only. And so we'll just have to air them out or um, spritz them for the run and they don't actually get really clean until the end. Um, generally, we try to follow equity rules, which are if the garment is touching your body, like if it's a base layer, like an undershirt or socks or something, it gets washed before you have to wear it again um, or we provide you with a second clean one. Caroline Myers has a great question. She asks, what do you do to alter costumes if the original actor gets sick and the understudy has to take their place last minute and they're different sizes? Oh, good grief. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everyone's nightmare. No, um, so in general, um, we uh, try to find that happy line between um, constructing something as durable as possible because when actors wear something on stage that's like the equivalent of them wearing it for a month in real life like it's it is insane how um destructive it is to the costumes because i guess it's because everything they're doing is so big or i don't know <laughs> but um sorry i lost my train of thought <laughs> um remind me what we were talking about <laughs> That so the understudy, right, understudy, okay, understudy. So, um, and it's not just the understudy. So we try and make the garments as alterable as possible because I'm spending all of this time and effort um, to make this garment that's going to be worn for two weekends at the most. Right? That's a lot of time and money and effort. So we want to make them as alterable as possible so that we can keep using them over time. And then the same sort of thing. Um, so this doesn't happen as much here. Here, um, the only instances where I've had um, actors substituted, uh, it was a little more of a modern uh, costume. And so it was easier to sort of substitute something else um, that was still in the same design idea. Um, but at the, when I worked at the ballet, um, you know, someone would get injured and then literally everybody takes the next role up. So everybody's got to have a different costume than what they're already fit for. And so um, when we construct the garments, we add additional um, alterability inside of it. So there's extra fabric kind of hidden in the garment so that we can adjust it um, for um, if someone's larger. And then also there are ways to take things in to make them smaller. But sometimes you just kind of go, oh crap, and then have to start from scratch and come up with something uh, close, <laughs> but not naked. <laughs> and sometimes we just go, not naked is gorgeous. <laughs> Bobby asks as a designer um, or says as a di designer you're wonderful at adapting designs to fit a director's concept for example your work on Baskerville that led to costuming dummies puppets scene changers etc um, comment on adapting to meet a concept please right um yeah, yeah so um it doesn't get boring doing what we do because even if you're doing a show you've done a bunch of times already, it's not going to be the same show um, because the director has um, a leading idea that sort of um, guides everyone. And so um, we have a special date on the calendar that is called the deadline for major changes. <laughs> and
And up to that deadline, we attempt to meet any requests that the uh, director makes that are within reason. And then any requests after the major changes deadline, uh, no promises. But, you know, if we're getting sleep at night, we'll see what we can do about it. <laughs> um, but uh, that is something that you have to factor in to um, the process is that um, amazing discoveries are going to be made in rehearsal um, through the work that the director and the actors are doing. And um, some of the most exciting uh, things that, that come out of a play are discovered in the rehearsal process. Now that's a little late in the game for us because we're trying to make things, but um, it's so worthwhile uh, to sort of and plan for those things. Um, <laughs> but for Bobby and the and Baskerville, uh, he definitely um, threw in some uh, non-historical elements, and so uh, I guess figuring out how to mesh um, the traditional. Uh, story that everyone is expecting with these traditional characters. Uh, everybody's got a fixed idea of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And so how to mesh that with um, this new take on it that we did um, was, it was a really interesting uh, project to work on. I'm wondering if there's questions from the, from the floor, if anybody would like to ask one. You're welcome to put them in the chat, but you're welcome just to ask away. Sorry, I get a little flustered. <laughs> I start talking about something and then I'm like, wait, what was the original question? <laughs> Um, but things like this keep me honest and um, definitely uh, increase my respect for the performers that I worked with <laughs> because uh, it is not easy to stand up in front of people and have everyone look at you and talk. <laughs> um, so, yes. <laughs> I just want to amplify a couple things from the chat. Melissa says she'll punch grommets for you anytime. Oh, and, you. and the other thing, Sarah, and I want to make sure that you that you saw um, Sarah's note, I would just like to say that it's so inspiring to hear how passionate you are about your job. You radiate positive energy, and it's such a pleasure to listen to you talk about something you love. And so I just wanted to make sure that that you saw that in the chat. I also want to, um, Karen Brewster put in um, Bucks Rock Music and Dance Showcase Virtual Online Performance, April 30. Give me a thumbs up, Kara. Is that right? Is April 30 is right for Bucks Rock? Okay, good. And then um, also King Lear sings from Shakespeare's play off virtual online audio beginning April 23rd. So those are um, in the chat. So just good, good. Look, check those out. So I wanted to, to um, amplify those. Well, I'm watching our time and so, um, Bravo to Beth Skinner for a, just a, well, an incredible, so you must be an incredible instructor because I've learned so much today. So um, <laughs> thank you for sharing your energy and your passion and all your secrets behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, just, there's lots of secrets. Just, I'm so excited. So really I'll never get, it'll never be the same again for theater for me. So. Um, and I do, I do love my job and I'm super passionate about it. Um, but in theater, you know, sometimes we do get bogged down in the, oh my God, there's so much work to do and we're so stressed in the deadline. But um, working here and with our students um, is so amazing because just seeing their face light up when they're like, oh my God, I made this thing. That's so cool. And I'm like, you know what? That is so cool. <laughs> like, thank you students for constantly reminding me how awesome, you know, what I do is. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing it all with us today. And I'm gonna give Paige the last word. She said, yes, thank you. I really enjoyed learning about costume design creation, very insightful and intriguing. So thank you so, thank you so much, Beth. We appreciate you. And thank all of you for joining us today for Women on Wednesday. We'll see you next time. Thank you.